Good afternoon and uh, happy 2022. It's uh, good to see you. I hope you all had a very Merry Christmas and that you made Santa's nice list and he brought you exactly what you wanted. Uh, also, Happy New Year to everyone. Uh, and what a new year it is. Our Montana State University Bobcats are heading to Texas this week to take on North Dakota State in the FCS championship game. Uh, I expect to make a friendly wager with uh, Governor Doug Burgum in North Dakota. Um, I understand the odd makers uh, don't favor the cats, but I do. Uh, I'll put touchdown Tommy from Butte up against anybody in North Dakota. Go cats. Some of you were here with us uh, 365 days ago. One year ago today, I stood in this room and swore a solemn oath to uphold the Constitution of the United States and Montana. With an outstanding team assembled, we rolled up our sleeves and got to work. Our focus was and remains getting our economy going, changing the way Helena does business, and protecting our Montana way of life. And we've made great progress. Working with the legislature, we enacted one of the largest tax cuts in our state's history because ultimately, this isn't the government's money. It's the money of hardworking Montanans who earn it. And our tax cut will let Montanans keep more of what they earn, providing $120 million in broad-based tax relief over the next two years. We also reformed our tax code to help Main Street businesses thrive and create more good-paying jobs. As much as our tax cuts and tax reforms will help hardworking Montanans and small business owners, we also recognizes, recognize that the state's current regulatory scheme is truly a wet blanket for job creation and it's in need of an overhaul. That's why we launched a top to bottom review of all regulations in every state agency. We are committed to getting rid of that wet blanket and cutting red tape, reforming, rolling back, and repealing unnecessary and burdensome regulations. We invested in our teachers, making it easier for starting teachers to stay in Montana or come back home. We provided seniors and low-income Montanans with property tax relief. We strengthened Montana's freedoms from our First and Second Amendment protected rights, which do not stop at the doorstop, doorstep of a college to our most fundamental right, that is our right to life. We made critical investments in infrastructure. We have allocated nearly all of the ARPA funds we have received from the federal government. And we use ARPA funds for responsible, long-term investments to benefit future generations. We're investing over $275 million to provide more Montanans with access to reliable broadband. And we're investing nearly $440 million for critical water and sewer infrastructure projects throughout the state. And I was proud yesterday to deliver our first check in Beaverhead County to Dillon to help them with their water supply. Prioritizing active forest management, we more than doubled the number of forest, forested acres treated in 2021 over 2020. We took steps to combat the drug epidemic creating the Heart Fund and ANGEL initiative to help folks struggling with addiction get the treatment they need. And we met with Montanans in every one of our 56 counties. While we have capitalized on tremendous opportunities to bring the American dream into greater reach for more Montanans, we've also faced challenges. COVID-19 remains a concern, though we're not in the same place we were a year ago. We now have additional tools at our disposal, including expanded vaccines and new treatments to prevent severe health outcomes and treat Montanans who become infected. And because of the tools available to Montanans and our success with putting them to use, I firmly believe the state does not need to have, have to exercise emergency powers. These tools include life-saving monoclonal antibody treatments, which have proven remarkably effective, 
uh, which is the state has now distributed to 42 counties, and our new oral antiviral medications, which are currently distributing to 22 counties across the state, with more product expected each week. Additionally, vaccines are available to Montanans who want them. In fact, more than half of eligible Montanans are fully vaccinated, including nine out of 10 seniors. Even still, we feel the virus, the virus is toll on our communities. Tragically, we've lost more than 2,900 Montanans to COVID. Their loss can't be captured in a number on a dashboard or on a TV screen. Their family, mothers, fathers, grandparents, friends, and neighbors. And their lives remind us all of the importance of getting vaccinated and the data bear that out. Vaccination remains the best way to prevent hospitalizations and severe health outcomes. We've learned a lot in the last 22 months. The virus knows no boundaries. Montana's experience is like that of other states. New cases in Montana have ebbed and flowed over the last year, just as they have throughout the country. Like other states, we faced a challenge a challenging surge with the Delta variant, though ours came later than most other states. We sprang into action to help our hospitals and patients get the resources they needed. But in the last month, Montana saw a steady declines in new cases and hospitalizations, and we're now amongst the lowest rates in the country. We, however, expect cases to increase with the Omicron variant which is far more contagious. While more contagious than previous strains, Omicron appears different in other positive ways, according to studies and public health officials. The rates of hospitalization and severe illness appear lower with Omicron, especially those who have received their COVID vaccines. The risks to severe lung and respiratory issues appear lower, re reducing the need for ventilation. Omicron is a high, high degree of transmiss transmissibility, appears to result in rapid case increases, but also rapid case decreases. Some treatments, which are in limited supply throughout the country, appear effective against severe outcomes. And my administration will continue to work tirelessly to ensure Montanans have access to therapies they need. Vaccination also appears to be effective. That's why I'll say it again. Getting vaccinated is the best protection against severe illness. I've gotten my shots, including my booster, and I encourage Montanans to do the same. But just don't take my word for it. If you're unsure about getting vaccinated, talk to your trusted personal health care provider today. And I'll say this again, getting vaccinated will remain a personal choice in Montana. The state of Montana will not mandate it. As we've seen over the last year, infections have risen in states with a variety of mandates, including shuts downs and closures and states without them. Heavy-handed, one-size-fits-all mandates don't work. It took President Biden almost a year to admit this truth. But COVID cannot be solved by the federal government. Our course out of this virus doesn't come from federal mandates. It will come from people in communities throughout our country exercising personal responsibility and sound judgment. That's why we've stood up against the president's overreach against his efforts to mandate vaccination. Montana law is clear. No Montana will be discriminated against because of his or her vaccination status in the provision of services or employment. And we will continue to defend the rights of Montanans against the heavy handed federal government. And while we have improved the state's response to the virus in the last year, we've also focused on getting our economy going again returning to normal and ending government overreach. We protected Montana businesses from frivolous lawsuits. 
We ended arbitrary restrictions on businesses like hours of operation and capacity limits that were putting Montanans out of work and leaving families unable to make ends meet. We provided clear benchmarks, and when they were met, we ended the statewide mask mandate. We increased local elected officials' oversight of public health actions in their communities. We were also the first state in the country to end federal supplemental unemployment benefits and launch a return to work bonus program. We incented work instead of unemployment and it's working. We've recovered all jobs lost since the start of the pandemic. Since last January, our unemployment rate has fallen to the lowest rate ever recorded in the state of Montana. By opening Montana for business, we have more Montanans working than ever before in the state's history. Standing here one year ago, I laid out four core principles that would guide everything we do. One, our first guiding principle is to grow our economy and create more good paying jobs. For too long, Montana hasn't been living up to our full outstanding potential. We've seen jobs and opportunities grow in other states while they haven't here. As a result, our kids and grandkids have had to choose between staying here in the place they love and with the people they love or leaving the state for better jobs and better pay and greater opportunities elsewhere. Too many choose to leave but they shouldn't have to face that choice. Over the past year, we've helped make that decision easier. We've created better opportunities here. We've made Montana more competitive. Back in June, we launched our Come Home Montana campaign to bring our kids and grandkids back home. When they return to Montana and bring their families and jobs with them, our communities are better off and our way of life is protected. That's what our Montana comeback agenda is all about. And I'm proud that we made significant progress in advancing that agenda. We've implemented pro-jobs, pro-business, pro-growth policies. We're creating an environment where Montana is more competitive and where businesses can grow, thrive, and create good paying Montana jobs. We cut income taxes. We implemented, eliminated the business equipment tax for 3,600 businesses in the state, which will help businesses invest in their operations and in their people. We created the Entrepreneur Magnet to encourage businesses to come to Montana, bring good jobs, good paying jobs to Montana, and stay in Montana, becoming part of our communities. We created the Montana Trades Education Credit, which will boost trades education by funding as many as 1,000 trade scholarships each year. We're also working with our two and four year colleges to help Montana businesses meet their workforce needs. In addition, we're empowering our workforce with in-demand skills. We're empowering our kids with greater educational opportunities. We gave local school districts flexibility to adopt more innovative curriculum. We made it easier for parents to pursue the best education for their kids. We provided incentives to boost starting teacher pay in Montana. Taken together, these efforts will pay dividends. Our kids will have greater opportunities to learn, thrive, and reach their full potential, and Montana will be better off for it. Two, our second guiding principle is to bring fiscal responsibility back to state government. We have delivered these pro-jobs, pro-growth, pro-family policies, including delivering our promise to cut taxes for hardworking Montanans, all while being fiscally responsible. We held the line on new general fund spending, limiting growth to less than 1% per year in our biennium budget. Our Republican budget reduced spending by $145 million compared with the previous administration's budget proposal. Our Republican budget has a strong ending fund balance and preserved the state's rainy day fund. 
Like the budgets of hardworking Montana families, our Republican budget is balanced, conservative, and avoids cuts to essential services. Three, our third guiding principle is to reform the way Helena does business. Because it's not just about dollars and cents, it's about putting the customer, putting customer service first. Our state agencies have been listening to and working proactively with stakeholders from local communities to associations that represent our state's diverse interests. My first executive order, which I signed my second day in office, established the Red Tape Relief Task Force, which Lieutenant Governor Kristen Juris heads. The task force is conducting a comprehensive top to bottom review of regulations in every state agency. They are leaving no stone unturned. From bureaucratic processes to permitting hurdles, as the Lieutenant Governor reminds me, there's no quick fix after decades of lip service to red tape relief. Effective long-term solutions are part of a marathon, not a sprint. But I can attest, Lieutenant Governor Juris is keeping a record-breaking pace to cut back the thicket of unnecessary, burdensome red tape. Fourth, our fourth guiding principle is to protect the Montana way of life. We made our state safer by cracking down on drug dealers and helping those battling addiction to recover. We strengthened the integrity of our election security laws, working to ensure Montana's elections are fair and free of fraud. We protected Montanans' right to freely exercise their religion. We defended our Second Amendment rights by expanding concealed carry and prohibiting the enforcement of any federal gun bans. We've protected the most vulnerable among us, unborn babies, with critical pro-life measures. Facing a historic drought and fire year, we prioritized aggressive initial attack against wildfires and more than doubled the number of acres treated by the state. But I couldn't have done this alone. When I was sworn in one year ago today, I said, and I quote, we have an opportunity to help Montana realize our full potential. We must seize this opportunity and act to do so will require leadership, but no one leader can do this alone. It will require all of us to work together. And we did. We worked together. We work with Republicans, Democrats, and independents. We work with legislators. We work with stakeholders. We work with our dedicated state employees. We work with people who care about the future of Montana and people who want to leave our state better than we found it. We seize the opportunity, and I couldn't be more proud of what we've accomplished in this first year. I could go on and on, and I probably already have, but I'm filled with enthusiasm, enthusiasm for Montana's future. Together, we've tapped into Montana's outstanding potential. Just one year, we've helped create greater opportunity for more Montanans and made huge strides in protecting our way of life. But there's still much to do. My message today is the same as it was that I shared with the state over this last year. We're just getting started. It's in the honor of my lifetime to serve as Montana's governor. With Montanans at the front of my mind, I'll continue working to create better opportunities for all Montanans, just as I promised on day one. God bless all of you and God bless Montana. And with that, I'd be happy to open it up with some questions. Yes. What is your administration doing or planning to do to try to address those problems? Yeah, and I, I see that in our hometown in Bozeman. We see it here in Helen up in Kalispell. Uh, we have a shortage of housing. We've had a lot of people move into the state. Uh, very frankly, we have a, uh, uh, the demand has outstripped supply. Uh, there's a number of steps we're taking. This is why we made the historic investment in trades education. Uh, we need more homes. That's why we need carpenters and plumbers and electricians. We're also working to streamline the permitting process. 
uh, so that we can get permits for subdivisions more quickly. Uh, but uh, we need the contracting industry to build their capacity. There's many communities in the state that haven't built a new home in 30 or 40 years. And we're working with some of these rural communities to help them as well. Yes? Follow up on that point. With, oh, thank you. Um, with the, the federal money that Montana received for affordable housing for people who were burdened, burdened by COVID, there's a, approximately $150 million that Montana hasn't spent so far, about $7 million that we had to give back at the end of last year. Um, what are your plans for getting more of that money out the door to people who need it? Yeah, so. Uh, we have been constrained by some of the federal regulations on this money. That's why we've asked the Biden administration for additional flexibility. Uh, we're getting the money out, and I'm proud of the rate at which we've done. We've allocated now about 100% of the ARPA dollars, um, and uh, uh, more of it goes out every day. Uh, flexibility from the federal government, it came with a bunch of strings, and it's hard to target it. It was more designed for urban environments than it was for more rural ones. Yes. Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask about, you talked about the really low unemployment rate, and Mike noted the uh, workforce shortages that's ongoing. So I understand that we also have a record low labor force participation rate right now, and Montana also saw the second highest quit rate in the country last month. Um, does that concern you, and, and what policies could you look at for that? Yeah, so we do have record unemployment. We also have a record number of people working in the state now. Um, there is, has been this phenomena with people quitting their jobs during the pandemic. It's kind of given them a chance to kind of reflect on their life and what they want to do, and people have made career choices. Uh, in our own family, we've had some of that go on. Uh, so I think the, there is, uh, and there's still a desperate need for workforce. As we talk to the business community, the number one issue is we can't find qualified people for the jobs. Uh, we've done a number of things in healthcare to help with uh, recruiting folks to the state. Uh, and we'll continue to work with these various industry groups, but uh, it's really this focus on education to close this gap between the needs and the skill set that we see in the marketplace. Uh, Governor, I wanted to ask about um, testing in the supply chain. Uh, what is your administration doing to keep up increase Montana's access to, to rapid COVID tests? Yeah, so we've, uh, we've been getting out the tests that we have, and we've also uh, applied and asked for additional tests, and we believe that those are those are coming. Um, I mean, we're the uh, as I mentioned in my remarks, uh, Omicron is a concern. I'm pleased to see that the severity of the illnesses don't see, seem as bad. Uh, also, I reflecting on some of the other uh, jurisdictions that are further ahead of us in this uh, variant. It seems that the infections go up very quickly and they come down very quickly. I'm hopeful that that's the experience we'll have here in the state. Again, the best protection against the virus is to consider getting vaccinated. I did it. I got my booster. I would encourage Montanans to do the same thing if they haven't been vaccinated yet. Do we have any online questions? Okay, is there another one in the room? Sure. Uh, Governor, you mentioned the uh, positive effects of uh, some of the ARPA money. I was wondering if you see any irony in the fact that you, know, you oppose that and not a single Republican voted for it, and here you are kind of touting its positive effects on that. Well, I appreciate you raising that question because I, I did oppose it. I think it's fiscally irresponsible. Uh, when I was in Dillon yesterday presenting the first check, I made it very clear. I said, if we're going to spend our grandkids' money, let's spend it in a way that our grandkids benefit from it. So we're going to be good stewards of the dollars we're receiving. I think the allocation of this money in the first place, I'm very concerned about the effect that this spending's having on the cost of groceries and gas. We're seeing inflation uh, impact all Montana families. Uh, that's why we prioritize using this money for long-term benefit uh, as it comes into the state. Yep. 
Any other questions? Yes, Mara. Yeah, going back to the testing that we talked about before, um, right now the allocation of tests that's being distributed by DPHHS are mostly going to hospitals and, afford, and um, assisted living facilities, less so to jails, um, even local health departments aren't getting quite as many percentage-wise. Is your administration thinking about shifting that so that um, more different segments of the population have, have access to such valuable resources? Yeah, I'm not privy to the exact allocations of them. I'm on a weekly COVID call, and if there's a need there from these groups, I would have them just reach out to our office, and we're happy to make sure we get the allocation. Just to, just to clarify, in some of the reporting that um, that we did a couple of weeks ago, a lot of folks said that they either didn't know how to get access to rapid tests, could the state do more with PSAs or with other types of um, uh, education about what these resources are, how to get them, and, and why they're important? Yeah, if anybody has any questions, they should just reach out to our office because we've been almost daily contact with all the various groups that have been requesting this, and there are tests available, so we can get them to them. Yes? Yeah, I have a question about um, forest management. When we're talking about doubling the amount of when we're talking about doubling the amount of acres treated compared to last year, to put an acre under management, uh, is this just sort of identifying the land that we will be treating over the coming years, or are things like clear cuts and thinning already been done in these twenty-five thousand acres? Like, can you go into a little bit more detail on that? Sure. So uh, the actual numbers in twenty twenty. The state treated about 11,000 acres. This included good neighbor authority projects that we did on federal land as well as projects we did on state land. Uh, it didn't include all of the federal work that went on. We're hoping to get those numbers incorporated because it's part of Montana. Uh, typically, uh, clear cuts is not part of forest management. We tend to do, uh, uh, we're focused on doing fuels reduction uh, to make, to bring back healthier forests. Uh, we have completed 25,000 acres of treatment in the calendar year 2021. We hope to do better in 2022. Yeah, okay, we'll try again. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. All right, great. Um, I know we've kind of moved on to different topics, but you mentioned before in your answer to the question about our workforce shortage that you've been speaking with individual uh, sectors, and you mentioned the healthcare industry, but are there any specific things you can touch on, any specific examples? You said there is still that desperate need for the workforce, even though we have record low unemployment. Are there any specific things that you're doing to help get those workers back into the workforce for not just those big industries, but also our small local businesses? Yeah, so thank you for the question. Uh, again, we have more people working in Montana than ever in the state's history, and yet we still have help wanted signs out. I think the, the thing I'd point to is the M Tech program that we implemented in the legislature. It was essentially will, for any employer that wants to take a promising employee and invest in them through a tax credit, the state will pay 50% of the scholarship necessary for a trades education. This is going to get us carpenters, plumbers, electricians, meat cutters, cybersecurity experts. And again, it's up to $3,000 per employee per year, up to $25,000 per employer per year. Uh, I think this is one of the ways we've been very tangibly coming alongside smaller businesses. And we structured it that way, particularly so that small businesses would be able to take advantage of it. Good, we'll take one last one. Yep. Um, I wanted to ask about um, the drought we came out of last year. Um, one thing we talked about was um, the state was going to be a leader on proposing local drought management plans um, with the stakeholders in a collaborative environment. Do you have any updates on that? Because I know that, that kind of came up last year and I haven't heard much about it since then. Yeah, so thanks for the question. Um, first, I want to recognize this is one of the worst drought years we've had in a long time, and many of our ag producers suffered tremendously. In certain cases, crops were not harvested at all because there was nothing worth harvesting. Uh, we can't tolerate many of these years back to back. That being said, from what can the state do, our drought management plan hadn't been updated since 1995. So we've kicked off that effort. Uh, we allocated uh, uh, funds to do that analysis. It's being done, I believe, in the Department of Natural Resources, DNRC. 
Uh, and we expect the work to, most of the work to be done this calendar year. Uh, so stay tuned and we'll keep you updated. But as we find things, working with stakeholders, we're gonna uh, you know, implement them. So I wanna thank everybody for coming out today. Do you have one last question? Yeah, I do, I do. I wanted to ask about something that was big during the legislative session, um, appointing judges to vacancies. Uh, one of the judges who appointed recently, Andrew Bruner in the 18th district, somebody that you know personally, well served on the Petra Academy board. Um, how did your personal relationship with him influence your decision to, to pick him, particularly because he did not receive the most uh, letters of public endorsement from, from public comment during that time? Well, in the end, the decision's mine. I would say uh, the personal relationship had nothing to do with it. He was the most qualified individual, and that's why I selected him. Great. Thank you all for coming out today.